You're listening to Consulting Logistics, presented by Aborn and Company. I'm your host, Kyle McNaught. Thanks for checking us out. Today's going to be a fun one again. I had to bring him back. He was so much fun to talk to last time, uh, regardless of the time difference. But I bring him back, Richard Duncan of DKN Supply Chain. And we're going to talk about something that I think we most people are aware of it, but I never really took the time to learn about it. Dark stores. I can't wait to talk about this. So I'm not even going to waste the intro. Let's go. Bring it in, Richard, right now. Richard, how's it going? Hey, how's everything hey, since God. we last talked? Uh, yeah, cra- crazy times still down here in Australia, unfortunately. Uh, where I live in Victoria is back in lockdown. So we're uh, you know, stuck in our houses, working from home, uh, one hour of exercise a day, no more than five kilometers from home. So I haven't been surfing in a while, which is a bit of a shame. I uh, love it. Uh, so we're all just looking to get our COVID numbers down and, and get out of this thing. So, yeah. Because like it's summertime's just, coming up, right? For you guys, like it's you're just getting out of the correct. doles of winter, right? Yeah, correct. So we're, we're really looking forward to summer. It's been a really hard uh, winter to get through this. So we're really hoping we're getting the numbers down to, to get out and get into that Aussie summer, which would be great. Yeah. So. At least yeah. you can just hang out outside and practice social distancing a little bit where it's not freezing out. Yeah. All yeah, right. True. <laughs> well, we could always talk about coronavirus, but I, I want to talk about something. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about something we can yeah. – it's interesting. Dark stores. You kind of brought this subject to me, and I honestly, full transparency, had really no idea. So let's start with the basic. What is a dark store? Yeah, so a dark store really is a retail store that has been temporary or permanently turned into an order fulfillment node, typically for an online order, um, or it can be just for retail itself. So typically the dark refers to the hidden or behind the scenes nature of the operation. So there's no customers in the store. We really kind of got the term probably from the dark warehouse uh, side of things, which is a highly automated warehouse it really has very little human uh, interaction or elements working in it because of the automation. So it's dark. You don't really need the lights on. So I kind of think that's where the terminology might have come from. Basically, it's the retail team members, though. They're picking the orders as opposed to having them picked in a warehouse. It kind of yeah, tries to mirror the warehouse operations in terms of what it's doing within a retail environment. First really appeared in Australia, at least, around the online grocery distribution channels. So I know in London and in probably a place like New York and LA, that probably is more in the grocery element. And that's where we start to see it, where they start to repurpose the retail store for online fulfillment as opposed to just pure customers walking in, doing the transaction in store. So again, it was a way of creating fulfillment nodes uh, with, you know, with the uh, idea of online fulfillment in, uh, in, in mind. COVID's really accelerated it here uh, and around the world. And we're seeing really big examples of seismic shifts to using the retail footprint that retailers have as fulfillment nodes. So traditionally, uh, being very light, probably less than 3 or 4% of retailers I know in Australia and Asia would have used their stores in that way. Now we're probably seeing up to 50% of them attempting to use their retail stores as fulfillment, uh, given the COVID situation and lack of foot traffic but obviously the boon in online sales. Some of these examples you might see around the world would be Waitrose is a really famous one in UK. They have been obviously leading that for a while. Whole Foods just came out with some announcements as part of Amazon. They're going to be setting up more dark stores. Probably the classic ones that I've been following, at least in America, has been Target and their use of their stores as fulfillment nodes as opposed to using their warehouses and which is turning out to be a bit of a success story as well from what I understand. So yeah, so that's really a dark story. It's a kind of a, a retail store that's either repurposed or set up uh, permanently to become a, a basically an online fulfillment warehouse for one of a better term. So what are the benefits of it? I mean, it, and sorry, like I'm still kind of trying to picture this. Uh, it's just, it's interesting. I mean, it sounds genius right especially in the age of corona and the age of like brick and mortar stores are dying but e-commerce is blowing up it makes so much sense is it truly just a retail store where like the shelves are there and stuff but just no customers and the retailer uh, workers are just going around kind of picking that or is it it's essentially just using kind of the back warehouse that the retail stores have to be more fulfillment and not about stocking shelves 
Uh, look, it, you see many different types. So the different types of dark stores that you get is number one, there's the fully dark store. So that is a, a retail store that really has been closed to the foot traffic or the public. And it's only the only people that are within that warehouse are the pickers. So essentially it might have all the branding and livery of say a retail store, but the customer can't actually go into it. So it's it's been essentially shut down uh, or repurposed. Some of them are, you know, some of these dark stores really, they're leaning more towards a, a warehouse and a store. What I am seeing now, of all the ones I've looked at, at, they do exhibit the typical layout of a, of a retail store, for better or for worse. There is kind of the partial dark store that we find as well. So that's probably more your target example, where customers are still coming in, you've still got all the foot traffic, uh, but you also have uh, the order fulfillment happening as well. So you've got a mix of customers and pickers working within that store. So again, the layouts are, are pretty much the same as stores, um, which is you know to be expected. The pop-up store, we see a bit of that as well. So where a retail or online fulfillment needs to urgently set up for say like a sales event, they might take a, a retail store or a, a small warehouse for a short period of time and, and pop up the store. Uh, the pick from store model, the local delivery offer, that's been around for a while now. Um, the click and collect hub sort of forms part of this as well. Typically a dark store has not only a distribution element to it, but you can also usually come to that store and do a click and collect from that store. So not going into the store, but going to say a, a pickup location at the front of the store, um, give them your number, show them the app, and then you can pick up your items. We also see now with COVID, a lot of those dark stores will have a contactless or car park delivery as well. So basically the app tells when the customer's in the car park, they come out to you, they find you which bay you're in, and then they, um, they also bring the delivery to you. A lot of the big retailers here in Australia and Asia are doing that, particularly the grocery store retailers. Uh, designated zones within uh, within car parks for for that um, contactless delivery. We start to see some technology really filter through uh, for micro fulfillment centres, and these these are pretty smart. Uh, there's a company in Israel called Fabric. They are starting to repurpose underutilised basements and car parking centres within high density CBD areas where they're putting mini uh, automation hubs in there to do grocery distribution as well. And the other one I'm seeing, it's just sort of, I've just read about in the Wall Street Journal was uh, Amazon looking at mall conversions as well. So looking at some of those stores like Sears and JCPenney, maybe repurposing malls into distribution centers as well. The other slightly off tangent example I've seen of it here really is Uber and Uber's associates starting to use commercial kitchens or dark kitchens as well to you know, do high, high, high quality, high efficiency um, you know, food, uh, food preparation and distribution uh, for their delivery network as well. So really those are the kind of the types we're seeing, but the big retailers are really getting into the fully dark stores now. So only pickers, no customers, all set for efficiency and high output. You know what's fascinating is like you describing it, <clears throat> the curbside, right? That kind of became our new normal. Once Corona hit, curbside yep. pickup, it came new normal not only with the big, the big kind of groups, but everywhere. Uh, restaurants, small restaurants, little mom and pop stores all around. Kind of me. I'm just taking my personal example. I I think that it, it's fascinating that it's a dark store because I never even thought of it as that. But you're right. Like that has become something that I think everyone's sort of seeing. Um, I think I, everyone had to pivot towards it. So I think Correct. people pivoted without really understanding what they were doing. It was just like, crap, I'm shut down. People can't come to my store. What do I do? Well, the safety is curbside. The safety is this, which I still see and still seem to be something that's extremely prevalent. Like I remember before, like kind of uh, – not to make this all about me, but right before we – before corona hit, we were having a kid, my wife and I. Uh, and it's funny because I talked to my parents and they're like – all the all the stuff's about buy food, buy food, get your things, get ready, pre-make all this stuff. And we just laugh at them. We're like, we've got Instacart. We've got all these like grocery apps. Like our grocery store will deliver to us. 
Like it's someone in their car walking the aisles, picking out the food we want. And if the food's not there, like texting us or like communicating with us via our smartphone and then coming back here and then being able to deliver it. And like, sure, Corona threw that for a little bit of a mix up or whatever, but like that sort of like trend has definitely been going on. So is the technology that's really enabling dark stores more or less the 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 rise of the smartphone and that type of stuff? Or what type of technology is enabling dark stores more and more? Um, so really what I'm seeing is that the large retailers moved to dark stores uh, quite some time ago. So from a technology standpoint, they were already building the capability within their current retail networks to use stores as a fulfillment node. So what we saw is that uh, essentially their, their technology platforms are really highly integrated between the logistics uh, systems and the retail systems. So we're really seeing a blurring of that technology between the two. Now, the other end of the spectrum, you have the retailers who really hadn't got into that and then COVID really lay waste to their, their revenue and they were forced into it. So uh, what I see with those types of retailers that weren't prepared, a lot of manual systems, um, you know, paper picking, um, you know, manually picking items, you know, really inefficient, um, you know, rekeying, uh, you know, confirmations into systems. So, you know, the really inefficient. So there's a it's a, such a large gap between the retailers who have been prepared for this for, for reasons and retailers who were forced into it uh, because of the COVID situation. What, what so, about, um, sorry, like I was thinking about this, but, um, oh man, I lost my train of thought. Uh, I guess let's go back to the questions. But so when I think of it, right, I really think of it as a, B to C type of thing, uh, because it is customers going to brick and mortar on that type of stuff. Does it exist in the B to B world? Is there like a way? Because like I think of like how this whole transportation works, and like if it's not the customer themselves going to the business and kind of curbside pickup, it's individuals, and like in theory, it's like small parcel, but it's even like last mile delivery of someone in their own car. I mean, it's the Uber Uberization of everything, right? So how how does this work in the B to B sense? Yeah, so I've seen a lot of B2B uh, starting to happen as well, um, where a lot of them already had sort of delivery services anyway. So if you took a typical auto parts uh, retailer within sort of uh, Australia or Asia, they typically would have a delivery service bolted onto each store anyway. So they had sort of their own freight network uh, that they could utilize for say vehicle off-road or urgent spares. So some of that infrastructure is already in place. So they were very well placed to already you know, really spin up these stores as dark stores. Clearly the freight volume though is, is changed. So we always sort of saw with the big retailers, there was always the classic uh, warehouse uh, that might either be a national warehouse or regional warehouse supporting the store from a replenishment perspective, but also supporting them from a click and collect and then obviously an online delivery. There, again, the balance of power has kind of changed between warehousing and retail store. So, uh, you know, some of the retailers I've been talking to recently uh, have a large component of their business as, uh, as B2B. And so, again, they're utilizing those stores to service the business customers as well. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's become a real thing, uh, and I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. Oh, absolutely not. It is not going away anytime soon, especially when you describe what it is. It's like, oh, yeah, no, this is here to stay. It was already here to stay, but now in this new normal pandemic world, it's going nowhere. I mean, you right now in Australia are probably seeing most stuff be a dark store, right? Correct, yeah. So at the moment, particularly here in Victoria, it's very limited the amount of retail that can actually open. So the only avenue some retailers have to keep retail, uh, to keep retail uh, revenue going really is to operate those stores um, as online fulfillment stores if they want to keep the revenue going. Um, I've even seen some great examples of the smaller end of the market, say a, a coffee store repurpose themselves as a wholesale coffee bean distributor using baristas as couriers and really turning their, their uh, major uh, you know, cafes into mini distribution hubs so, and again, sort of hacking the system, you know, hacking the points of sale to become literally warehouse systems, you know, overnight. So 
the ingenuity of how I've seen some of these systems used has been quite impressive as well um, around the, the country as retailers struggle. So, I mean, the, the benefits are almost obvious, right? Especially when you're living in this world, because it's the, how are you going to make money if people can't come? Well, clearly finding the right way, finding, use, utilizing the technology people are using, uh, that makes a ton of sense. What are some disadvantages? Because I think that's something people aren't really thinking of because it is right now just like, I need to get product out. Where are people who, I mean, you talk about it, right? Some people were prepared for this. Where are the people who weren't prepared for it? Where are disadvantages that they haven't thought of yet? Yeah, so it's it's interesting. So some of the reasons why you would go to a dark store are obviously unlocking your national inventory asset. You know, a lot of 70, 80% of retailers' inventory is locked within the retail store as opposed to the warehouse. Typically, they've gone there for speed to market as well. Um, they want to be close to the customer, you know, to service the same day in the two hour. Um, you know, utilizing the downtime of retail stores has been a big trend as well I've seen within within this. Uh, you know, line balancing the workload between warehouse and the retail store, and obviously improving short picks and back orders. So, you know, I've got inventory in retail, I don't have in the warehouse, do I want to disappoint the customer? No, I can divert the order to go to a retail store and fulfill that. So great customer experience. And we also sort of saw people setting them up anyway for either strategic or tactical reasons. And um, within Australia, that was largely to defend against Amazon coming in and taking up uh, some of that market share. But I mean, the disadvantages, you know, and they become really evident once you start operating these dark stores. And it really depends on the level of sophistication you have with your systems and how integrated they are between retail and logistics. But some of the challenges I see really, the loss of control once you go to a decentralized model. So when you're bucketing all your online orders into say, you know, one to five uh, warehouses across the country, you know, it's very easy to control five central points of inventory and inbound and outbound and dispatch. Uh, very easy to stay across that. When you spread that logistics network out into anywhere between 100 to say 1500 stores, that decentralized model becomes very hard to manage unless you've got really good systems, which give you a visibility of what's going on at both a logistics and a retail uh, area. So the loss of order visibility is something I hear about all the time. So if it goes into logistics network, you can track that order all the way through the milestones. Once it goes into a retail setting, sometimes that order can get lost. And it's only until the customer tells you they haven't seen it, that um, you know, it raises a query. So again, that's all about systems. Uh, the, the retailers who didn't have the systems, who were working manually, really start to lose visibility of where the order was for the customer. Obviously it drives a lot of traffic into call centers if you can't give the customer visibility and certain of where their delivery is. The other thing we see is the retail store is laid out for retail. It's laid out for an optimal customer experience. So when you go in there, aesthetically, it looks great. Everything's uh, laid out and in position on the shelf yeah, to entice you to buy it or to draw your attentions to savings. Clearly, the retail layout is not optimal for high volume picking. So where customers I've seen have had uh, stores for picking where they've picked 10 to 15 orders you don't really see the inefficiency but all of a sudden when you've been asked to pick a thousand orders a day you really start to see the layout problems within a retail store so that's something that I've seen a lot of the limited SKU range as well in a retail setting versus a warehouse setting so this is something that people forget is that your average warehouse has somewhere between 10 to 50,000 SKUs uh, within the warehouse available for picking. A retail store may only have somewhere between five to 15,000 of those available SKUs for picking, unless it's a, a, a huge big box store. So that's something retailers are really struggling with at the moment, that a lot of stores only hold partial amounts of the range. So you can't actually fulfill generally all customer orders from a store. So that leads to things like split deliveries where if you order two items, you're getting one item from the warehouse, you're getting one item from the retail store. I've got nearly double the transport cost, got nearly double the packaging cost, and now I've got two orders to track for the customer as well. So not really a great customer experience. Retail also, the shelving doesn't hold a lot of inventory. So if you go to a warehouse, you see big bins of inventory, I can hold 100 units in there. I can probably only hold 10 of that you know, SKU item 
on a retail shelf. So again, the replenishment task becomes quite, uh, quite massive within a retail environment. Inventory location is the other one that's really hurting people at the moment who are trying to set up dark stores. So within a warehouse, you know, we're really sophisticated. We track, we track inventory as it comes in, we track it through to put away. We can track it all the way to its reserve locations and then we do replenishments into the big bins. So we know where the inventory is down to the bin within a warehouse. When it goes into a retail store, it's receipted in. We don't really know where it is. It could be actually sitting in the back dock. It could be sitting in an interim or an overhead somewhere in a retail store. It could be on the shelf or it might even just be in the wrong location. Typically, retail stores don't really have the level of accuracy that you find in a warehouse. So trying to find product within a retail store can get quite tricky for, say, a team member who doesn't have the institutional knowledge where that item is. So that's the other big thing we, we see as a challenge within retail. The capability of the retail staff to execute logistics tasks as well is another thing. We always see that is, you know, getting, getting stores really to partner with logistics to understand how to best do a task is, is really important as well. We see a lot of limitations around the receiving docks and storage as well. So typically, our retail location is designed to take one or two deliveries a day from a warehouse now, all of a sudden, they're getting 30, 40 deliveries a day to keep up with the volume of stock going through. Um, if you're in a large mall, you may have restrictions around when you can actually bring stock into that dock area. and You may have to share it with other retailers, so all of a sudden it becomes a fight for space. Typically, the other thing we've seen is in retail over the last 10 years, we've seen footprints where the, retail, the back storage areas in the receiving docks have shrunk over time to become less than 10% of the overall retail footprint. And that has led to obviously greater sales or greater footprint, but it's leading to challenges now where the, the loading dock, the storage and the back area aren't really sufficient to house this type of high volume operation. Probably the other one, as we've alluded to, is the retail technology versus logistics technology gap. Um, you know, retail was really focused on that front of house and customer experience. Logistics was focused on understanding where stock is, high volume throughputs. Uh, so again, that disconnect is what we're finding. And sometimes, you know, things like marketplace integration or dropship offers typically are hooked to the logistics system, not hooked to the retail system. So all of a sudden, if you're starting to throw your logistics task into a retail store, it can play havoc with some of those systems that work in the back end. So, and that's probably some of the key challenges I've seen within the retail. You know, so it's not all bear and skittles, as they say, uh, just <laughs> diverting the orders into the retail section. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine too, it causes chaos when it, for the, the the retailers and even the shippers, people just putting their product in there. It's probably going to be chaos when yeah. it was so piecemeal. It was something kind of quick because yeah. how are you planning? How do you kind of be aware of what your inventory needs to be and all that type of stuff when you have this yeah. brand new mode of purchasing, this brand new kind of yeah. buying power that the customer has, and all of a sudden you got to learn of like, oh well, even though this was shut down, people still were coming but they can't even predict foot traffic right now because they really don't have the technology yeah. to understand like, Hey, this is what this is going to work like. Cause I mean, yeah. we heard e-commerce was way up during coronavirus. It's still way up. Uh, lots of companies have to figure this out. Uh, yeah, it's, it's immense. So the other thing, yeah, inventory, I can't stress this enough is the, the other thing that really challenges stores is that inv inventory uh, accuracy is pretty low compared to a warehouse. So, you know, do I really have those 10 items uh, when I send the orders down to the store? Typically, you're probably about 98% confident, 90 to 98% confident in a warehouse. You've got the item and you've got the right quantity. That's much lower in a store location. So that becomes a challenge as well. You also don't have some of the finer things of control, such as quality assurance system and fraud prevention systems in the retail. So such things as check weight cube systems on a conveyor line at a warehouse that prevent the wrong item going out don't exist in a retail store. Um, so, you know, that's a real challenge. Packaging and waste as well is something to forget about. All of a sudden, I've got to bring in cartons and satchels and shrink wrap and tape to handle a 1,000 to 2,000 orders a day into a store. Where am I going to store that? 
So those I was are, thinking yeah. even like the opposite side, right? Too with the shippers, yeah. like the people putting their product within these retail stores. How much money goes into the packaging and stuff? Because, like you said, the layout is very specific. It's to capture attention. It's to do that. Same goes down all the way to the packaging and all that stuff. What happens right. when it doesn't matter and it's strictly straight up the product? Yeah. I mean, that's like all of a sudden all that money you spent on like our packaging like is what gets us and all of a sudden takes someone's getting this the product and they're like well this is crap and i can get this thing for a lot cheaper it's just not as pretty like i could see that also being sort of like a thing that people aren't even thinking about right now yeah so all these things start to come into play and and we see it playing out so good retailers have been you know they've been working away at this for about three or four years um, you know, getting ready for this uh, to happen, whereas you know, a lot of retailers have been thrust into this and, you know, they're finding these challenges. But with the other challenge we kind of find with the partial stores where you've kind of got a mix of customer foot traffic and the pickers in the store really is probably the focus. You know, customers, if they see you in the retail store, you know, they want to come up to you and ask you questions. Now, all of a sudden, your pick productivity is going down the proverbial so you don't have that problem in a warehouse. You don't have customers walking into a warehouse going, hey, can you help me with this product? So, um, you know, this is probably why it's starting to go more dark store. Uh, you're really focusing down on utilizing that store and that asset and be becoming a high throughput, high efficiency operation as a try to try to be everything to everyone within that store. Uh, yeah. So, so you've talked about it a little bit of the people who've uh... – They've spent three years, four years, 10 years so far kind of preparing themselves for it. What type of strategy, what should people who haven't been doing it kind of start doing? Uh, this clearly is going to be, a pretty sure, the drinking game of me saying new normal and coronavirus people are already wasted if yeah. they're like playing a drinking game with this thing. But it is what it is, right? It's going to be yeah. here. The dark store is a thing. Uh so what should people be doing? Because, hey, they quickly tried to roll up their sleeves and figure it out when they were told they're shutting down. What now that they're being like, this is something that the customer's getting used to, e-commerce is being big, what strategies, what should they be, what should be the first step? If they're, if I'm even just a shipper who's going to put my product into a dark store, what's something I should be doing? Yeah, so the first thing, obviously, is obviously looking at bringing logistics disciplines and talent into that uh, store environment. So typically, you know, most retailers do have a logistics or a supply chain component to, to their overall you know, corporate structure. So really bringing some of that discipline in, the logistics teams and supply chain teams have already dealt with all these problems before. So there's really no need to reinvent the wheel. There's generally a whole lot of IP within the business. Or if you don't have that within your business, bring in consultants who obviously know, know about this stuff and know what they're doing. Rather than you go through all the heartache, let them share all the tips, uh, logistics and supply chain tips with you uh, straight away. Obviously, beefing up systems and um, getting the inventory aligned so that you're more successful as well. So that might be, you know, reassessing some of the, the, the point of sale systems, maybe retiring those or enhancing them or bringing in new systems. You know, with cloud-based systems these days, you don't have to do a multi-million dollar implementation to have success. You know, there are some really nice systems out there that are cloud-based, you know, for, you know, less than sort of $50,000 implementation and six weeks, uh, you can have cloud-based systems up and running. Recently saw an American company, Lucas Systems, I think they they can offer Android uh, devices within a store that will do a lot of the same tricks that, um, that the logistics operations will do, such as picking zones, batch picking, waiving orders, uh, that type of stuff as well. So, you know, there are systems out there that will allow you to bring all the smarts of logistics warehouse into your retail setting as well. Um, I think looking at some of those optimizations as well, and, you know, the old adage of having KPIs and metrics to measure and manage as well, knowing what a pick rate should be, knowing what great looks like is also half the battle. You know, this is uncharted territory for some retailers. Um, you know, luckily we have the internet and, and, you know, good consultants and whatnot. You can find out what great looks like as well. So you know whether your operation you're actually running in that retail store is actually up to par. Um, using, you know, using some of the tricks and tips, you know, from logistics as well, using things like Lean, 5S, Process Improvement, Kaizen's. Uh, we are seeing some of the new retailers who, who really aren't encumbered by legacy systems also looking at things like robots and cobots 
So having an automated follow me trolley that automatically goes around the retail store because it doesn't have to bump the customers anymore, you know, it allows them to leapfrog retailers who have legacy systems that have got sunk costs. So, you know, those are probably some of the things that I would think about if I was trying to get match fit. Um, but definitely, you know, fixing the, the systems, the inventory, and getting the logistics discipline and talent into that retail setting is really, really important, yeah? Oh, absolutely. It's definitely going to be, I mean, the technology. And like you said, logistics exist. So that the good thing is, especially with, um, the, I've been hearing like titles of like chief supply officer, supply chain officer, like it's becoming bigger and bigger uh, in more of, it's not the stepchild anymore. Supply chain really does matter. So it exists, but it's also, it touches so much, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, no, <clears throat> let's start to wrap up. Let's hit some stuff, uh, the fun stuff, right? The trends yeah. in the future. What what are we looking in the future of this? How do I mean? No one could have ever predicted what that it was going to be such a huge thing as it is right now. It seemed to be more of an efficient. Let's be smart with it. Uh, what what's what's the future of dark stores? What what's kind of what's the outlook look like? Yeah, so the COVID things obviously accelerated many facets of business. You know, from digitization to obviously you know what we're seeing with these dark stores. So. I guess my prediction, if you want to call it that, you know, that it is here to stay. The re large retailers were already investing in it before COVID. So um, they were already doing the proof of concepts or already proven the concept, particularly in groceries. So I will see, I think large retailers will make a lot of those dark stores permanent fulfillment nodes. So if they maybe only had five or six uh, you know, dark stores in their network, that's probably going to grow to hundreds of dark stores within the network. Particularly too, as bricks and mortar probably takes, uh, you know, probably take, has a bit of a decline, repurposing some of those assets such as, that they've already got leases on, they've already paid for the fit out, they've already got, you know, retail staff. Um, I think they're going to want to, you know, get payback on those assets that really aren't generating the foot traffic. I see that a lot of the small retailers, I think they will invest in those cloud-based systems and I already see a lot of the logistics cloud-based providers spinning up retail versions of you know of the logistic systems they have that are more fit for purpose for those for those retailers so i see that happening i think what retailers will start to do as well is they'll start to see the inefficiencies of the layout particularly if they got a dark store and i'm i'm pretty certain i'm not going to put foot traffic through there again i mean really you can go and relay out that retail space to be more efficient in terms of a warehouse as well so, you know, strangely enough, the thing I do see when I see photos of these dark stores, they, they look exactly like a retail store. And I sort of go, I'm a little perplexed as to why I wouldn't relay that out so it's more efficient rather than just keep it looking like a retail store. I mean, I've got no customers coming in. Why does it need to, you know, why does it need to look like a retail store? So I think changes in layout will, will come along. The use of automation will definitely happen. Uh, I, I can see already the the cobots and the micro fulfillment centers they are going to happen right it, it, you know we you knew it was coming into logistics it's already there you see a lot of you know this amr technology coming in i think it's going to leapfrog into retail and these um these dark stores pretty quickly as well um, i think the other thing that's going to happen in the future is we're going to have to start adjusting the freight models to support this change very decentralized model a lot more of the hub and spoke. The big retailers who have the volume, who have thousands of orders a day, they will start going to localized delivery offers um, with that as well. But again, the systems are going to need to keep up so that you have the visibility, the tracking and the milestones to give the customer a great experience. And look, I think the overall is we're just going to see a massive blurring of the lines between retail and logistics. They're going to mold into one uh, there will be one shopping experience for the customer and, you know, it will need to be seamless and it'll need to be effective. So that's kind of my pick for the sort of the next 12 to you know, 48 months really in, in retail and logistics. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, I think you nailed it too with that whole, that Uberization or that, that gig economy, uh, becoming more and more of a thing, uh, especially as companies kind of are shut in shop and people are out there needing work. Uh, that idea of like, hey, I'm going to pick up hours on this app and I'm going to go fulfill for a dark store. 
So I yes. don't need to have the huge training. I don't need to have any of that stuff. I'm going to have technology in my hand that's going to tell me, go here, pick this, put this in here. I completely yeah. see the blend of all that type of stuff. It's going to be – it, it's fascinating of what's everything happening. Uh, but Richard, I know it's – Nighttime where you are, you can see with me, the sun's coming out, uh, sort of. It's a little cloudy here in uh, Massachusetts, but thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I appreciate it, as always. There's a million other subjects that we're definitely going to talk about later. Uh, so tell the audience how they can get in touch with you, how they can kind of connect with you. Um, yeah, let them know. Yeah, look, um, usual one, LinkedIn. Uh, that seems to be the go-to place uh, to connect with me. So, uh, yeah, jump on LinkedIn. You'll find me there, Richard Duncan. Um, just, yeah, yeah send, a, send a connect or follow me, you know, either one, up to you. Uh, or, you know, just reach out if you'd like to have a chat or, you know, if there's any, uh, any more topics that you want to discuss, really. So, yeah, it's been Absolutely. excellent. Absolutely. Yeah, could not recommend any more. I mean, Richard's got so many awesome topics, so definitely reach out to him. You also get the cool, like, for the American audience, the people listening uh, in America, like, it's cool to just hear what the other side of the world's kind of doing and stuff. So really awesome to talk to you again, Richard. Stay safe. Have fun in the lockdown. Get your hour workout in. Hopefully get some <laughs> hit some waves soon. Yeah. Uh, have some good time out there eventually, hopefully. Yeah, will do. Thanks again, once again, Carl, for having me on. It's been excellent. Absolutely. Have a great day. See ya. Bye. And that's our show. Have a question about dark stores or anything for Richard? Ask it in the comment section, and we'll be sure to get an answer. In the meantime, subscribe and share our show. Thanks for watching Consulting Logistics. I'm Kyle McNaught. Rock and roll.